This is Queensland's Sunshine Coast, about 100 kilometres north of Brisbane. A place of balmy, tropical weather and golden beaches that stretch for miles. It was here, in this quiet and beautiful place, that innocent young lives were cut short in two of Australia's most notorious crimes. One was the 1987 sickening rape and murder of a 12-year-old girl oh, named yeah, Sean Kingy. Her killers were a depraved couple who were on the run from police across four states. We'll tell that story soon. But first, we look at the 2003 abduction and murder of a 13-year-old boy called Daniel Morecambe. The disappearance of Daniel is told in two parts. The first set not long after his abduction. We follow the remarkable courage and determination of his parents as they endured one of the longest police investigations in Australian criminal history. The second part details the incredible police sting that would finally trap Daniel's murderer. Let's begin by taking you back to the time when Daniel Morecambe disappeared. The village of Palmwood sits in a valley in the hinterland of the Sunshine Coast, a world away from big city crime. Bruce and Denise Morecambe decided this was the perfect setting to bring up a family. But in December 2003, their 13-year-old son, Daniel, disappeared. We got up fairly early that day. Um, it was a Sunday. Um, the boys, uh, often on the weekends, uh, picked passion fruit on a neighbouring property. And um, it was also a day, uh, being the 7th of December, that um, we, were, we had organised for a Christmas work do, uh, which was uh, in Brisbane. But uh, as it turned out, on that morning, there were just some misty showers passing by, so uh, it was decided that um, they just postponed the picking for an hour and start at 7.30. Thus, they, uh, they had the perfect excuse, I suppose, to put it like that, that they didn't have to come to Brisbane to uh, attend the Christmas function with us. On the afternoon of Sunday, the 7th of December 2003, Daniel, a twin and one of three Morecambe boys, headed off to the nearby town of Maroochydore to buy Christmas presents. Since his parents were away for the day, Daniel planned to buy his presents and hide them before Mum and Dad came home. We weren't aware that the boys had, uh, had uh, split up on the day. He'd taken the hour-long trip many times before. A 30-minute walk up the street until he hit the main road, and from there, he'd hail a bus for the 20-minute trip to Maroochydore. Senior Sergeant Julie Elliott was a member of the Queensland Police Media Unit. She became closely involved with the investigation from the start. So Daniel left the house about one o'clock in the afternoon to walk down to the Nambour Connection Road to catch a bus, the 130 bus. And when that bus didn't come, uh, unbeknownst to anyone, that bus had actually broken down. So a second bus was sent. It went past at about 10 minutes past two, but even though Daniel hailed it, it didn't stop. What people saw from that bus was a man standing behind Daniel and a blue car and another man standing near that blue car. When the third bus went by a few minutes later, which was to stop at that bus stop, Daniel wasn't there, nor was the car or the two men. Well, when I went to pick Daniel up at about 4.30, I actually drove past Woombai and saw the next bus stop and I saw a broken down bus about to be put on a tow truck. So when I came back home I said to Bruce, oh, the timetables might be out because there's a broken down bus. So when Bruce went to pick up uh, Daniel at 5.30 and he wasn't there, we thought that maybe the, the bus was going to be late so I, I jumped on the internet to check out the timetables and we realised that 5 o'clock was the last bus. Police hoped someone may have seen Daniel at the Keel Mountain Road overpass, two kilometres north of the landmark Big Pineapple. He was wearing a red T-shirt with the word Billabong printed on the front, dark knee-length shorts, white socks and light-coloured shoes. 
It's a busy road and hundreds of cars streamed past as he waited patiently by the roadside for the next bus. It was here at the Keel Mountain Road overpass that Daniel was last seen, standing beside the highway, talking to a man on a grassy ridge. A second man was in what witnesses thought was a four-door 1980s dark blue sedan and there were reports of a white, unoccupied courier-type van parked just over there. When the Morecams returned late that afternoon, there was no sign of Daniel. As darkness began to fall, they became even more concerned. So we drove down to Maruchador, the Sunshine Plaza, jumped out, asked one of the bus drivers to help me check the timetable. I was sort of panicking a bit because Daniel wasn't at the bus stop there. Um, he told me the last bus was five past five, so we came, came back home to see if Daniel was here. He wasn't here, so we really started to panic. Despite a desperate search of the surrounding area by his parents, there were simply no clues as to his whereabouts. Bruce and Denise Morecambe spent a sleepless night worrying about their son. In the morning, Sergeant Elliott organised a media conference appealing for public assistance. People then did start to ring in to tell police that they had observed a blue car, uh, two men, and Daniel waiting for the bus. And we are desperate for any information about him. In fact, there has never been as many calls to police about any other case in the history of Queensland Police Service as Daniel's. And we've had something in excess of 14,000 pieces of information come in, which is quite unbelievable. And every one of those pieces of information have to be logged and looked at. Police hoped for the best, but feared the worst. The circumstances surrounding his disappearance were extremely unusual. So the search intensified, and even more police and emergency service volunteers were brought in to scour a wider area. They hunted through bushland, and hundreds of homes were canvassed. The operation then went statewide, and a description was circulated throughout Queensland. It was a heartbreaking appeal made at the site where the teenager was last seen. We both want Daniel home. It's been seven days since he was last seen. It's a matter of urgency. Somebody must have seen him somewhere. Daniel Morecambe's parents held today's news conference on the busy highway in the hope that someone might remember seeing their son there. We want Daniel back. Detective Inspector John Maloney was in charge of the investigation and was facing a mountain of evidence, including conflicting witness accounts. Well, we definitely have witnesses saw him walking down towards the bus stop, and uh, we, we are certain that he was by the side of the road under the bridge uh, waiting for the bus. Um, after that, there's a lot of speculation based on uh, various witnesses' accounts of what happened. Um, we don't know whether there was one or two persons involved. Queenslanders rallied to support the Morecams. The Daniel Morecambe Foundation was established and inundated with donations from the public. The foundation was set up initially to help maintain the hunt for Daniel and his abductors. Please call Crime Stoppers. No one will ever know you did. The huge amount of money pledged to the foundation also paid for television and radio appeals, along with posters and pamphlets which were circulated throughout Queensland. Daniel's twin, Brad, and his older brother, Dean, struggled to come to terms with the tragedy of the abduction. You just can't really imagine it ever happening. Just, it just happened one day and that's just, you just got to put up with it. You can't really do anything about it. Once I dreamt that, because on from here to the, where, under the bridge where he went, it was like a steep, steep part off the road. I dreamt once that he, might have fallen down there, but obviously the SES have looked and things, so, yeah. It's different, catching the bus by myself and everything and coming home by myself. It, everyone's pretty nice at school. Sergeant Julie Elliott became very close to the Morecams and was present at a family gathering for Daniel and Bradley's 14th birthday just 11 days after the abduction. It was very significant in the symbol of the three baptism candles of the boys, Daniel, Bradley and Dean. 
Uh, there were three, three of us police there, and Father Yarn and Father Joe, and the candles were lit, but one blew out, one extinguished. It was so symbolic, it was really a very, very emotional experience. And that was the day that Monique said, you know, my Daniel's dead. The Morecams were living a nightmare. Everywhere they turned, they saw Daniel. Photos of him scattered throughout the house. His bedroom littered with memories, spread across his bed, a specially made quilt presented to the Morecams as a moving tribute to their son's memory. Daniel Morecambe's disappearance and the family's pain was felt not just by those here in Queensland, but by people across Australia. A national appeal was launched and the public responded. Bruce and Denise Morecambe decided that the most positive thing that they could do was to expand the foundation to fund the education of all Australian children about stranger danger. Doesn't matter if it's daytime, nighttime, on a busy road, in a shopping centre, can happen at any time to anyone. I mean, Bruce and I didn't ask for this to happen, but it can happen anywhere. And that's why we're launching the foundation to appeal to people to, you know, to be, um, educate their children on child safety and abduction, and it can just happen to anyone. Uh, a vehicle of interest and uh, a person of interest that's Police sifted seen, through literally uh, thousands of pieces of information supplied by the public and released a sketch of a man seen talking to Daniel on the day he vanished. They also appeal for information about the blue sedan and the white van also seen near the overpass. Days turn into weeks, weeks into months, but despite releasing descriptions of the men, the car and the van, police are still no closer to finding Daniel. Oh, we've made inquiries in every um, every state of, and territory in Australia and uh, we've had investigators uh, travel to most states. We've made inquiries overseas. Red ribbons and bouquets adorn the overpass where Daniel disappeared and even though they slowly became faded by the sun, they still conveyed the enduring and total public support for the Morecambe family. Daniel's family and friends and the police continued to appeal for any information that would solve the mystery and they simply refused to give up. Everywhere you went in Queensland, you could see Daniel's face. It was on posters, bumper stickers, pizza boxes and milk cartons. Many companies gave generously of their time, money and resources. But they weren't the only ones who rallied around the Morecams. Among the many individuals who lent their support was Dave the Trucker. Dave turned his prime mover into a travelling billboard. His regular route took him from the Sunshine Coast to Toowoomba and Lismore, travelling around 3,000 kilometres every week. What price and what, what acts do you put on the, on the life of a child? You know, people will be sitting there at home tonight when you're sitting there, have a look at your 15-year-old or your 13-year-old and think, what they're doing today, that's what uh, Daniel is missing out on, his parents and brothers are missing out on. So, you know, it's a small token, it's a small effort as far as I'm concerned. The Morecams were overwhelmed by the remarkable generosity and kindness offered to them. Mostly, it came from complete strangers. The coast is crying. This country's uniting in the search for a little boy. December 2005 marked the second anniversary of Daniel's disappearance, and for everyone, the realization that he wouldn't be coming home. My anger hasn't come out. It's really strange. I sort of I think it's sort of sits inside, but um, I know the day they do find these people, they won't be able to stop me. I don't think they'd let me near them, that's for sure. I suppose when we think back to the uh, the very early days, um, where I uh, basically wrote a sign 
it's a message from the heart that says, swing you bastard, justice will be done. And uh, really that's, that's the, the controlled anger I suppose that I have. Daniel did not disappear into thin air. Daniel was abducted and we believe murdered. Daniel, what we believe, is dead. His pain's over. You've got a family living this every waking moment of their life, an extended family. And from a police perspective, we need to and have to get these people that are responsible so that it doesn't happen again. Yes, someone knows. Police at the time firmly believed that the smallest piece of information could lead to solving the mystery of Daniel's disappearance. The state government offered a $250,000 reward for information, but then a private donor increased that to a million dollars. The determination of the Morecambs would never waver and the pain would last for eight years until the mystery would be solved. Coming up, the incredible police operation that would finally capture Daniel's murderer. The investigation into Daniel Morecambe's disappearance lasted almost eight years. A team of more than 100 police sifted through 20,000 public calls to Crime Stoppers and conducted an incredible 10,000 interviews. The Morecambe's greatest fear was that Daniel's disappearance would be filed away as a cold case. So we wrote to the coroner and it was a simple one page note saying uh, to the state coroner, uh, mate, we need your help. This is us, this is Daniel, this is the circumstances we know. Is there any chance you can help us? A coronial inquest was held, allowing the questioning under oath of all persons of interest, including many known pedophiles. They started it off by pulling in um, dozens of persons of interest, these, mostly these people on, on the list of known pedophiles or people who had sort of come on the radar as, you know, potential suspects. And they were all called into the inquest to give evidence. One was named P7, Brett Peter Cowan, now living in Western Australia. He was well known to police, having had prior convictions for shocking violent crimes against small children. He'd even been interviewed by two detectives soon after Daniel disappeared. If you had him abducted Daniel, would you tell me? Probably not. And they were sceptical about his denials and alibis. And these were guys who dealt with pedophiles all the time and he just, he really stood out to them. And more importantly, he put himself at the scene where Daniel disappeared from. He told them he was going to pick up a mulcher and uh, this was the way he drove and this is the way he drove back and at that a particular time and, and they knew straight away that he put himself driving past the exact place where Daniel had been waiting for that bus. At the inquest, Denise Morecambe watched as Brett Peter Cowan denied under oath that he'd abducted Daniel. And I said to Bruce, Jesus, that, that's him. And when Cowan sat, he was probably running oh, two metres from us. He turned around and just stared at Bruce and I and just smiled straight at us. So we, I knew that day it was him. By the time of the inquest, police were already closing in on Cowan after they'd found he'd lied about being with a drug dealer on the afternoon Daniel disappeared. The false alibi was damning, but not enough proof. So detectives set up a long and elaborate undercover operation designed to get Cowan to confess. A large group of covert police officers posed as members of uh, an outlaw gang, really, sort of almost like a mafia type operation, a very professional criminal gang that was involved in all kinds of things from running drugs, smuggling diamonds, prostitution, all kinds of things. 
It all started when Cowan boarded his flight back to Perth. An undercover police officer was in the next seat. They befriended each other and uh, that was the start um, of uh, what Cowan believed to be um, something he was interested in, which was uh, to be uh, one of the leaders uh, in a crime gang that uh, you know, had enormous wealth. After many months of careful grooming by the undercover police acting as criminals, Cowan was taken to a suite at Perth's Hyatt Hotel for his final interview before induction into the gang. Consumed by greed, Cowan was excited when he was told his interviewer would be Mr Big, the gang boss. He wanted to be rich and powerful. Uh, he wanted to be controlling and um, uh, this was the big operation that was heading his way. But what he had to do was report to the Mr. Big uh, of this covert operation. He had to confess anything that he'd done in the past uh, so that it couldn't come back and damage the organisation. The trap was ready to slam shut as the undercover cop, acting as Mr. Big, entered the room to meet with Cowan. There are detectives in a room next door. Um, they obviously had the whole room wired up. They had cameras in there, uh, hidden in the room. They had hidden microphones, all that sort of stuff. What you're about to see is part of the chilling confession in which Brett Peter Cowan calmly admits to murdering Daniel Morecambe. And if I've got to postpone what we're going to do for a few months to sort this out, I'm happy to do that for your sake, all right? Because I'm told that you're pretty loyal, you build up a good relationship with some of the boys, and they speak very highly of you. So what do I need to fix? Yeah, OK. You know, yeah, I do. All right, so, OK, so you hear that, but what I'm saying is, you know, I, I, I need to kind of go, I need to stick you right back to the whole thing yeah. so that I, so that if there's anything like, I don't know if they've got any DNA or all that kind of shit. No, you know, obviously they, they haven't found the body. It must have been an incredible moment for them when he said, yeah, I did it. Um, incredible. After eight long and frustrating years, detectives finally hear Daniel Morecambe's killer confess to an undercover cop playing the role of the gang boss. Cowan goes on to describe how he spotted Daniel on the highway and how he parked his white four-wheel drive nearby and walked to where Daniel was waiting. Uh, I've walked down and sat there and then... Did you talk to him for long or...? I didn't talk to him at all when I got there. Maybe just look as though I was waiting for the bus. OK, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, the bus drove past and that's when I said, I'm going down to the shopping centre, do you want a lift? Yep. And he's gone, yeah. Cowan describes how he then drove Daniel to an abandoned, demountable house at Roy's Road at nearby Beerwa. He never got to molest him or anything like that. He panicked and I panicked and grabbed him around the throat and just thought I knew what he was dead. Cowan says he then dumped Daniel's body in the nearby bush. Took him out of the car, yep. um, dragged him down the embankment. And when you dragged him, did you leave anything? Oh, How did you drag him? Just, by the feet, by the arms? Or? I, did, I carried him over and threw him down the embankment. And he, OK, so you threw him over the embankment? Yeah. How, how far was that? Metre and a half. Metre and a half, yeah. Have you left any marks or...? No way. OK, you pushed him just like the old cowboy movies. Alright. So, he's gone down the bank, down the embankment, about a metre and a half? Yeah. What have you done then? I went down there and just went on dragging through. I don't know how far it was. Um, until I found somewhere I thought was... A good spot? Yeah. So was that sand, grass, what? Sandy. Did he still have all his clothing on? Did he leave anything behind? Or? No, he had all his clothing yep. on. Yeah. Um, 
I've stripped them off. Yep. And um, trees and all that sort of stuff, and branches and covered his body with that. His clothes I took back with me and threw them into the creek. The fake gang boss says he's worried there could still be traces of the murder and insists Coward must fly back to Queensland to reveal exactly where he dumped Daniel's body. He took police exactly and reenacted the crime exactly as it, he describes it unfolded. So there were some uh, demountable buildings um, where for reasons unexplored and unknown, and maybe we don't want to know, um, Daniel was relieved of his clothing at that particular point. Daniel was murdered and drew his last breath uh, in that particular building. We heard how Daniel's body uh, unceremoniously was thrown over the, the embankment um, in this depressed, uh, uneven ground. And, uh, and Cowan, in a smug way, was identifying that uh, he would scrub out the tyre tracks from his vehicle with a branch that he'd broken off. So he was cool, calm. Cowan went back a few days later and most of Daniel's remains had been taken away by animals. But he did find a, a piece of Daniel's skull, so he smashed it with a shovel. That's how remorseful he was. He had no remorse. After Cowan re-enacted the crime, the undercover police then arrested and charged him with Daniel's murder. We wish to advise that a short time ago, a 41-year-old man was charged with a number of offences relating to the disappearance of Daniel Morecambe at Wombai on the 7th of December 2003. The charges preferred are murder, deprivation of liberty, child stealing, indecent treatment of a child under 16, and interfering with a corpse. A subsequent search of the area uncovered Daniel's shoes and some of his bones. In March 2014, Brett Peter Cowan was tried, found guilty and sentenced to life. Despite their anguish and frustration during the long and complex investigation, the Morecams have paid tribute to the police undercover team. We have to thank certainly all the covert police officers, the SES searchers, the scientific experts that all contributed to making sure that a sex offender, a murderous sex offender, was caught and exposed for his actions. Mr Big, he's actually a police officer over in Western Australia. He's now a Day for Daniel ambassador and to assist us to get some of the schools in Western Australia involved in Day for Daniel, which is the last Friday of every October. So he had a son exactly the same age as Daniel, and it really struck him hard, and he went to a dark place for a little while, and he wants to get back, and he wants to help the foundation to get to get going as well. Now, over the years, the, the numbers have grown. This year, we'll have about 2,800 schools that have registered to have a Day for Daniel. We also have the Daniel Morecambe Child Safety Curriculum, which was written by the Queensland Education Department. That is now available in every single school in Australia that would like to have those lessons. All the lessons are on um, Queensland Education's website. They're all available. We've got 27 different videos on our website, all on the different safety messages, from internet safety to you know, crossing the road to, to being safe at the beach. The foundation has grown a lot over the last 12, 13 years and you know, we're really proud of the achievements that we've done and I think we have saved a lot of, of children. We've personally spoken to over 600 schools around Australia. Most of those are in Queensland but we have travelled around Australia and spoken to schools in every state and territory. Because Cowan was clearly a person of interest early in the case, there have been ongoing reviews of the conduct of the police investigation. In any police investigation, especially one as complex and, and long as this, there's, there's going to be things that they'll reflect on and say they could have done better. But in, in the end, I think it's always important to, you know, um, remind people that Brett Cowan is sitting in jail because of an incredible police operation that, that got a confession.
the break, the story of another difficult crime investigation on the Sunshine Coast, which eventually tracked down the killers of 12-year-old girl, Sean Kinney. Springtime afternoon in 1987, 12-year-old Sean Kingy rides her bike home after shopping with her mother. It's common in this era for Sean and other children to be seen riding their bikes around the usually quiet streets of Noosa on the Sunshine Coast. But on Friday, November 27, as she pedals through a park, she finds herself in the wrong place at the wrong time. In the 1980s, Noosa Heads is an idyllic coastal retreat. It's home to retirees and young families seeking to get away from the hustle and bustle of city living. Well, we used to walk home from school with just us girls and um, it was a safe area. All our parents thought it was safe. We could walk around and do whatever we liked. Pretty much an old-fashioned coastal resort, you know, and people lived in small houses and we cruised along and we made fun of the Gold Coast and said, thank God we don't have the glitz and glam of the Gold Coast, we're still just an old mums and dads sort of destination. Beautiful place, never thought twice about a whole group of us walking home as primary school kids, holding hands, mucking around, thinking that we're going back to meet our mums at Noosa and everything would always be good. Sadly, though, all that will change when Sean's bike is found abandoned in Pinaru Park. Sean and her mum had been out shopping and they were buying some fabric or cotton for a skirt because Sean was going to a party on the Sunday. I think they were in the hot bread shop and Sean said, right, well, I'll meet you at home. I'll take the bike and go this way. Mum was walking home the other way. And her mother walked on a sand track through to the house, which wasn't a long way away. She expected to find Sean at home when she got there, but uh, when she got home, she wasn't there. So she kind of thought at the time, maybe she met some friends and was held up talking to friends. Later on, when her husband got home and Sean still hadn't got home, they went along the bike track and they found Sean's bicycle laying beside the bike track. Sean's parents know she would never have left her prized bike unattended here at Pinaru Park, just a few minutes from the main street of Noosa. Their concern for her safety heightens until, at around 8.30 that night, armed with a photo of their daughter, they walk into the Noosa Heads police station was treated as a missing person first off, but we were uh, a little bit suspicious that uh, she may have uh, been involved in some foul play. Well, I think we all feared for Sean's sa safety right from the word go when her b bike was found missing uh, and there was no trace of, of uh, Sean whatsoever. Sean is a popular girl here at Sunshine Beach Primary School, and those who know her describe her as gentle, and charmingly shy. She loves sports and regularly plays netball on weekends. And as a tall girl, she has an advantage over other girls her age. Another feature that makes Sean stand out is her long, straight blonde hair. I remember Sean as the most beautiful girl you could have ever seen in your whole, in the whole world. And she had the most lovely nature as well. She was just a good kid, and I remember one of her teachers saying, you'd think someone pretty like that who could be the queen of the school sort of thing would be a smart aleck with it, but she wasn't. 
when I found out that she had disappeared and everything changed, it was like a dark curtain got put over all of us while we waited for her to be found. Noosa detectives act quickly because of Shan's age and the fact that her disappearance was out of character. From the initial inquiries that um, Bob Atkinson had made, it didn't seem real, real good. Um, we were hopeful that she had just run away, um, but that wasn't the case. And uh, we were really, really concerned about her safety. And it's critical that uh, you act upon these things very, very quickly to establish what's actually happened. Well, I was in homicide at the time in charge of field investigations and uh, the call came in that Sean had gone missing. So we got a homicide team together and went straight up there and opened up a, uh, an incident room in the Noosa um, police station. Uh, inquiries were made in the, in the area, uh, news releases were made, uh, members of the public did come forward uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and claim that they had seen Sean in the park that afternoon. We were at that stage receiving you know, a fair bit of uh, uh, information from the public. And there was a, a dirty coloured um, Kingswood station wagon with a surfy type man and a plump woman seen in the vicinity. And we did ask for those people to come forward as well in case they had seen anything of Sean. This certainly became our major vehicle of interest at that stage. Police divers again combed nearby creeks today and aerial and ground searches were made. Hoping to increase public awareness, police display a mannequin dressed as Sean was dressed on the day she disappeared. They also encourage her parents to speak to the media. Barry and Linda are with us this morning. Good morning, Barry. Good morning, Linda. Remind morning. us, Linda, of Good the morning. circumstances under which Sean went missing, because as I understand it, uh, she'd only been about three or four minutes away from the last That's time right. you saw her. That's right. I went one way through the back of the park and Sean went around another way past the bowling club and tennis courts, etc. I mean, I should have seen her. She should have been around there somewhere. So we're looking at four minutes that somebody's grabbed her or... There are 17,000 Holden Kingswood station wagons registered in Queensland and 10,000 of them are white. It's a tall order, but police begin the arduous process of elimination. We are appealing to members of the public of Queensland to, who are the owners of White Holden uh, Kingswood station wagons to um, bring them to their nearest CI branch or police station so that their vehicles can be eliminated in relation to this murder. Then two people tell Detective Senior Constable Alan Burke that someone driving a similar vehicle was acting suspiciously on the Sunday after Sean went missing. There was a, a lady come, come forward on the Sunday afternoon um, and I obtained a statement from her. She said that uh, she had been sunbaking down at Castaways Creek and had an experience with a, uh, a male person down there and that male person was seen to drive off in a white HQ Holden station wagon. And she also mentioned the fact that her boyfriend had been with her at the time. And at this time, we were suspecting that it could have been a child abduction. I arranged for uh, him to come in next morning. During my um, interview with uh, this witness, he said that um, his car had been broken into on, at that car park on a number of occasions. And uh, he saw this person acting suspicious around the car and he, uh, this bloke, when they s saw uh, the two of them, um, jumped in the car and headed, headed north. And this was around in the afternoon of the, uh, that uh, Sean went missing. The woman's boyfriend gives the detective the registration of the suspect car. LLE 429. It's a Victorian number and is registered to Valmay Fay Beck. This means little to the detective. 
As far as anyone's concerned, it's just another White Holden to check out amongst the many thousands. As each day passes, fear for young Shan's safety grows. Sadly, and all too soon, those fears will be realised. The only lead police have about the sudden disappearance of 12-year-old Sean Kingy is the sighting of a white Holden Kingswood station wagon, which was parked near where she was last seen. Three days later, police receive information that a man driving a similar vehicle was noticed acting suspiciously in the car park at nearby Castaway Creek, just 90 minutes before Sean's abduction. The station wagon is found to be registered to Valmay Fay Beck, and police do an immediate check. They came back to me um, the next day and said that uh, the car was registered to this female. Uh, she was with a male person, Watts. They'd just got out of prison um, in Western Australia, and um, that address where the car was registered to was the um, stepfather of Watts. And they also learned from the uh, inquiries they did down there that the car and the occupants had moved to Queensland a couple of weeks prior to this. Police learn Barry John Watts and Valmay Beck both have extensive criminal records. Beck uses several aliases and often changes her appearance. They have outstanding warrants issued by Western Australian police. They had committed a series of crimes over there. Um, Watts, not long, I think it was a few months after Watts had been released from jail and moved in with Beck, he'd promised to stay on the straight and narrow, but it just didn't last and he hooked up with an old accomplice of his that they'd been committing crimes for about 15 years together there. So they started breaking and entering again uh, into houses and he also committed an armed um, robbery. Beck um, was wanted, she was charged with false pretenses, which I understand was from when they were breaking into cars and stealing uh, loose change money and bank books and then she would go and withdraw money uh, using other people's bank accounts. And she'd also had some form as well for social security Boy. fraud. Hungry? In their attempt to evade police, the couple travel from WA through South Australia, Victoria, and New South Wales before arriving here in Queensland. While in Victoria, they traded a small sedan for the white Holden Kingswood station wagon. Sean Kingy was riding her bicycle home when she was last seen. Her body was found this morning lying face upwards near a rainforest stream. It was spotted by a man on his way to work. She was partly dressed and had 12 stab wounds to the chest. Police say she was murdered elsewhere, then dumped. And our worst fears were met. There was just a feeling of despair right through the major incident room every detective there that um, this was the end result, you know. And it was extremely, extremely um, devastating to, to all the investigators. You could see, you could, you could follow what had happened. Her shoes and socks were just normal, like uh, uh, someone was just sleeping there. But uh, the sun had destroyed her face and features and everything. And it was very, very upsetting. Such a, a young girl, you know, snatched, her life snatched her from her at a very young age. And being a, a very innocent young school girl, to have these atrocities committed on her was just unbelievable. Um, these people were, were very sick. It was a very, very sick, perverted murder, very vicious. And uh, I think it's something which you probably would live on with you for the rest of your time. 
And it is something that is very hard to put out of your mind. When we found the body, there was it was a it was a mixed day. It was a mixed feeling. Um, it was good that they'd found it because that's why you think of the Daniel Morkham case, you know. Because Mrs. Kingy said herself uh, in an interview after, "I'm glad they found a body because we know she's at rest and nobody can hurt her anymore." Whereas if your body's not found, that's a lot di more difficult to deal with. The autopsy reveals Shan has been ripped and stabbed 12 times in the chest, three of those blows piercing her heart. There are two massive cuts to her throat, one of those going all the way through to the spine and one of her hands has been almost severed. Among the investigators delivering the news to Shan's parents is Detective Neil Magnuson. Because they were outraged what had happened to their daughter. Um, but they were also, like, I, you know, I was able to speak to them uh, and, uh, and discuss as to what had happened to their daughter. And uh, it, it must have been very, very difficult for them. Shan's parents want the killing. Five days after Shan Kingy's body is found in Timbiwa State Forest, family, friends, teachers, and police gather to farewell the popular 12-year-old. Any, any funeral is a very sad thing, but this was extremely sad. Um, loving, caring parents with a lovely family and just absolutely torn apart. Uh, it would bring a tear to anyone's eye. I don't think there was a investigator in that team that um, didn't lose something on that, over that time. The local community and Australia at large are sickened by the murder. Detectives now work closely with the media in their efforts to uncover more information that may help identify Shan's killers. We were doing exactly what the police wanted at that point because everybody was working around the clock. Some of those, those coppers, they didn't sleep and I don't know how they kept going but they were fantastic and you had to have a lot of respect for what they were doing but they were driven, they were all driven. They had kids and they'd seen too much. Just about all of the senior detectives there had kids of their own. I've got three daughters. And you sort of put yourself in the same position when you're doing these types of investigation. And uh, I don't know whether it makes it easier, but it certainly makes you more determined. The next lead comes from a young nurse, Nicole Close, who remembers a strange and unsettling encounter with a man and woman who were driving a similar vehicle. Nicole contacts Ipswich detectives. Her chilling story about what happened in the Ipswich hospital car park will give police one of their best leads. It was gone the end of my shift. I think the, the unit was busy and it was close to midnight, if not after, by the time I'd finished work. And I'd gone out to my car and I could see this car and it was coming towards me. It was speeding and I'm going oh dear and anyway, I got in my car and it parked right in front of my um, passenger side they slowly inched the car around so that they'd blocked me from getting from the driver's side at this stage they were asking me a question I wound down my window excuse me just a little bit lost do you think you're going to tell us how to get to North Ipswich? Uh, yeah, just take the main exit out of the hospital and keep going down the main road. It's the exit on your right. Right. Can you, um, can you show us on our record? Is that all right? Uh-huh. Yeah. He reached into the back of his car as I got out of mine.
showing him how to get to North Richland and I'm sort of like looking around and at one stage I can remember looking over into the car and seeing in the, in the back seat, because it was right there, that there was all these Hessian bags in the, in the back and ropes, thinking this is not good. And he's sort of like getting closer and closer and closer to the point where he was right beside me, he was right here. So just go out the main entrance and pick the This man the just out of nowhere came around the other side of the, um, the old mall and entered into the car park. The man, um, he jumped away from me. The guy walked past this opposite side of the car. He, he would have seen the whole thing. And I just thought, this is my chance. I have to get out of here. The incident occurred in early November, about two weeks before Sean Kingy's abduction. After Nicole tells her story, detectives ask her to look at some photos. She picks out Barry John Watts and Valmay Faye Beck, identifying them as the couple in the car. Then, another attempted abduction is reported. Well, we received further information from Ipswich detectives in relation to an attempted abduction of a lady from a shopping centre just near Ipswich and a similar vehicle was used in that attempted abduction. And um, with the information we got from the Ipswich detectives and the information we got from a member of the public in relation to a similar vehicle, we were able to put out an Australian-wide broadcast in relation to that Kingswood station, uh, station wagon. In that second attempted abduction, Watts holds a knife to the throat of his victim, but somehow she escapes, cutting his hand in the process. She too identifies Beck and Watts, and police are able to match a fingerprint found on her car to Watts. The net is finally closing on the killer couple. After nearly two weeks, Queensland police finally get a breakthrough in their investigation into the abduction and murder of 12-year-old Sean Kingy. A white Holden Kingswood station wagon is spotted in Lowood, a small town west of Brisbane, and police learn that a house there is being rented by Watts and Beck. Police find no one home, but the real estate agent shows them a money order for the rent purchased in the town of the entrance on the New South Wales Central Coast. We flew from, um, from Brisbane to Sydney and then made it to um, the entrance. And uh, that's when we, with local police officers, we went to the motel where the, um, the, where the vehicle was located. And, um, we gained entrance to the um, motel uh, with the assistance of the owner of the motel there with the key. And that's where we found uh, Beck and Watts. Get it when they go wild, you'll get it! Yeah, bitch! Beck and her de facto husband, 34-year-old Barry John Watts, were arrested at this motel at the entrance. They were quite surprised, I suppose. But, um, you know, they did a, a, accompany us back to the police station and, uh, and they were interviewed uh, in relation to the ab attempted abduction of the lady at Ipswich and also in relation to the murder of Sean Kingy. The two are expected to be charged with murder by the time they appear in Noosa Head's court tomorrow. Well, they came up here, they came up about six o'clock on the night they were apprehended down there, they'd, they'd been spoken to by, by detectives for about 12 hours and hadn't said boo. And uh, I got to talk to both of the offenders. I knew with Beck, uh, Beck was more upsetting than, than Watts because Watts was just a grub, whereas Beck had children of her own. And appeals were made to Beck in relation to, you know, if this had been your daughter, what? And after a few minutes, she gave us a version of what had happened. Look at that young one there. She looks nice. 
Did you not see her parents or have you no According to Beck's record of interview on Friday the 27th, she and Watts drive around the Noosa area looking for any vulnerable young girls. Their intention is to abduct a virgin to satisfy Watts's sadistic sexual fantasy. Let me try in the park. See the top? Yeah. Okay. It's a fantasy that has been building between the two for some time, and Watts tells Beck that morning, today is the day. By 5.30, they still haven't found anyone. And they pull up at Pinaroo Park. She and Watts sit in the car talking. There'll be someone here soon. I hope so. You know, I've got a really good feeling about today. I want someone young, you know. I want to be a first and last. All right, let's get out and get ready, huh? They step out of the car to stretch their legs. And that's when Watts is the first to spot an opportunity. Hey, here comes someone. Stop her. Talk to her. Excuse me. Um, I've lost my dog. It's a little white poodle. Have you seen him? It's a little white poodle with a pink bow. Um, Beck continues no. to distract the ever trusting Shan as Watts well, quietly approaches there, from well behind. Look at the door! Fueled by alcohol and adrenaline, Watts easily overcomes the young schoolgirl, putting a cloth around her mouth to muffle her screams. Watts puts Shan and himself in the back seat of the car, keeping her quiet and hidden from view. Shan poses no threat. She's on the back seat, securely bound and gagged with brown masking tape. <coughs> Watts drives down Forestry Road in the Tinbiwa State Forest, bringing the car to a stop about two kilometres in. Watts returns from the car with a large bedspread and lays it out. Like your hair. Beck stays by the car as her husband repeatedly rapes the young girl. On their way home, having dumped Shan's mutilated body further into the bush, Watts and Beck pass Lake McDonald, where they throw the bedspread containing a knife, tape, rope and the belt. Beck also tells detectives that she and Watts had sex that night. That was a fairly lengthy interview, as you could imagine, uh, and it went right through the night. She was then placed in the cells downstairs, and um, Watts was very, very agitated in relation to her not being in the cells. And it was then that he learnt that she had confessed and uh, dobbed him in. And he was quite rapable with her um, and really um, flew off the handle. We had water police come in and uh, search Lake McDonald just outside of Twanton and they located a knife and duct tape and rope and a doona and there was some blonde hair as well. While Beck is doing all the talking, Watts remains silent. He isn't giving anything away. He was just no good, you know what I mean? He, he was... He just had that proper, you know, career criminal attitude, uh, Thought we were back, I think you can call this backyard detectives. You know, you're never going to do any good with Watts. He, he'd held out for 12 hours with the other detectives, so he thought he could just keep going on an even keel, which he could. He didn't say anything to me. Police decide to use covert means to gather more evidence against Watts. While in the holding cells, listening devices are planted and police also use an undercover officer. 
They were in two cells. We'd set up the cells, uh, the two different cells, so that they could communicate. But they had to. Talk, there was a, a vacant cell in between, and they had to talk out louder. And they, they, they had to. You know, if they'd have been next door to each other, they could have whispered. And he kept calling. Uh, what kept calling the detectives, backyard detectives, and they won't get anything out of us. And she then <laughs> says after a while, oh, "I've told them all about it, Barry." He was probably cunning enough to realise that the cells could be taped and uh, he tried to make communications with her without um, saying too much. But his inquisitive nature couldn't help himself and um, as a result he uh, suggested to her that she should find something over in her cell and um, kill herself. The purpose of that being is that obviously if uh, she'd killed herself that any evidence that she had just given the police would be totally useless in a court. More than 200 people jeered and screamed abuse as 44-year-old Valme Beck and Barry Watts, aged 34, were led into Noosa Heads Court this morning following their extradition from New South Wales. We got three cheers, three cheers for the police. And I tell you what, that brought a tear to my eye. Never, ever, ever before or since did I have three cheers from the public for an investigation. Barry John Watts and Valme Faye Beck are charged with and murder. On the 20th of October 1988, here at the Noosa Courthouse, the jury takes just three hours to find Beck guilty. She receives three years for abduction, ten years for rape, and life for the murder of Sean King. A Supreme Court jury took more than six hours to find that Barry John Watts abducted Sean Kingy on her way home from school, took her to a secluded forest, her repeatedly and stabbed her to death. Watts is given a life sentence and Justice Kelly marks the file never to be released, describing Watts as a thoroughly evil man, devoid of any sense of morality. While he's in jail, Watts begins boasting to fellow prisoners about Shan's and another woman's murder. Other prisoners, including Beck herself, tell police Watts murdered 31-year-old trainee teacher Helen Feeney in 1987 because she caught him breaking into her car. In the same parking bay where the white... Beck told police that Watts returned to the car and told her that something was wrong and that basically a woman had caught him breaking into her car and he had killed her. Beck said something to the effect of, are you sure she's dead? And he said, oh yeah, she's dead, she's dead. Beck later uh, then told police that she saw Barry, she saw Watts put something wrapped in a red doona. She saw light coloured hair sticking out the end of it in the boot of the car and Watts later telling her that it was a body that he dumped at the lower it was tip. Somewhere up near where the grey car is, but I'm not quite sure whether it was closer to the white one. I eventually charged Watts with uh, the Feeney murder. Um, and um, throughout that trial, uh, because of uh, prison confessions and some uncooperative prisoners, um, some didn't give evidence. Um, and he was found not guilty. From her prison cell, Valme Beck makes a startling admission to Detective Bob Dallow, which links her to another thrill killer, Catherine Burney. Together with her husband, David, the Burneys abducted four women in Perth over a period of a month in late 1986 and held them captive for days at a time before strangling or stabbing them to death. Yeah, she told me that she'd uh, been in prison with uh, Catherine Burney and she was informed by the, uh, the Burney woman that uh, having sex uh, whilst murdering a female uh, was the greatest uh, thrill of all. And uh, once she told Watts 
uh, he definitely wanted to try that. During Beck's 21 years of incarceration, her health had uh, severely deteriorated from about the mid-1990s onwards. She uh, developed a, a weight problem, she had diabetes, she, her weight ballooned to around 140 kilograms. Um, she was only 160 centimetres tall, so that caused her a lot of health complications. On May 27, 2008, 64 year old Val May Beck died in Townsville Hospital from complications following surgery on her heart three weeks earlier. Because of the surgery, Beck was placed in an induced coma but never fully regained consciousness. Barry John Watts remains incarcerated in Queensland's Walston Correctional Centre at Wacol. I can't say that I wasn't happy when Val May Beck passed away. Um, I think, well, that's karma, it's just deserves. Um, as far as Barry Watts, well, I, I've had a few friends that are in the police force and um, one who worked in the, the system who's told me that, you know, things have happened to him and I think, well, you, you, you get what's coming to you. I mean, when he passes away, I think that's when I will relax and think this whole thing is over. Watts, in my view, is a cold, calculated predator, perpetrator of, uh, of serious crimes. Very, very evil person. To me, he shows no emotion. Um, and I believe the only regret that he has in relation to this crime was that he was silly enough to be tied up with Beck, who um, told on him. He is beyond description, in my view. She was the only one that's really told the version of these two people, uh, and obviously she painted it to suit herself. Um, I'm no doubt that she had more involvement than what she was telling the police in relation to this incident. Um, she did tell Watts, and she has gone along with it, and this is a woman that's got several children herself, uh, which is absolutely hard to believe, that saying that he wouldn't be faithful to her until he could have sex with a virgin child. And once he did that, and once she assisted him in that, that um, he would be faithful to her for the rest of his life. And she has gone along with that. Despite these two terrible crimes, the Sunshine Coast retains its reputation as a safe and happy place to raise children. Daniel and Sean live on in our memories, and the Morecambe Foundation continues working to educate children about their personal safety. It also supports victims of crime, especially crimes involving children.